And the second part of the evening is our presidential address by President Wendy Lana. So Wendy, without further ado, we'll invite you to make your presidential address. Tēnā koutou katoa, nō mai hare mai, ki tēnē pō he whakanui e nā takahoa a ta āparangi. I tino pai te kite i a koutou katoa. So it's a great pleasure to be with you tonight. It's a uh, wonderful opportunity for us to signal something of the work that we think academies like the Royal Society to Aparangi should do. Uh, many of you will know that national academies have been around for a very long time, some 350 years, uh, based on the premise that those recognised as intellectual leaders have a duty for collective endeavour to serve the people of their nation in a selfless manner. Now, we take that premise very seriously here at Ta'aparangi, and it guides the very wide range of programmes that we run. Uh, for those of us who have the privilege of serving as president, and I am delighted that Sir Neville is with us this evening, um, uh, we too have a thought leadership role, and it's in that capacity that I have been invited to address you this evening. Now, I'm going to speak to the topic of excellent research. You might think that that was a relatively easy discussion to have, that in my day job as provost of Victoria University of Wellington, Taringawaka, I should encourage my academic colleagues to aspire to ever greater heights, publish in the highest impact journals in their fields, supervise growing numbers of successful doctoral students and generate even more external research income. That in my role as the president of the Royal Society to Aparangi, our job is to recognise outstanding researchers with our awards and medals, acknowledging the very best with the elite status of fellowship, thereby, to quote our act, rewarding excellence in the broad areas of science, technologies and humanities, uh, that that's the work that we do. I want to problematise that tonight. What I want to do is show you tonight that research excellence comes in multiple forms, particularly in an era of impact and advancement. And for many of you are, who are here tonight who rely on research outputs to support your wider activity, you will know, and we rehearsed this a little bit with the companions this afternoon, that that shift towards engagement and relevance is really challenging our conceptions of what research excellence is in what is sometimes known as a grand challenge world. Now, as Andrew said, I am a social scientist, so I am going to begin by putting my social science hat on and contextualising this claim that research excellence comes in multiple forms in a discussion about changing modes of academic governance. Now, the literatures in my fields are dominated by accounts of the so-called neoliberal university, or perhaps more specifically, to use Slaughter and Rhodes' term, academic capitalism. What they're referring to are the processes of globalisation, for example, the rise of international university rankings, the Times Higher, the, the QS, uh, the Asia-Pacific Rim universities have their own version of this, the ever-increasing encroachment of what's called audit culture, the proliferation of research assessment exercises like our dearly loved PBRF, uh, REF, the one that I was accustomed to in the uh, UK era and so on, and the rise of highly individualistic academic subjectivities, including the so-called celebrity academic, particularly in places like the United States. Uh, anyone who's tried to bring in a big name American speaker recently will know the eye-watering fees that some of my colleagues are now commanding for the, the pleasure of their thoughts. Now, the political economists in my field argue that those processes are underpinned by the changing nature of knowledge production, increase in competition as more institutions compete for ever-declining public resources, 
the growth of a new set of actors who are moving into research and teaching uh, areas historically dominated by universities, the overproduction of PhD students, a tightening labour market, which means that there's a precariously employed cohort of early career researchers. And what the result of all of that is, is a research sector marked by new hierarchies and exclusions within and between institutions. So I'm just scene setting in terms of the academic debates in this field. Now, it's very easy to argue, and many of my colleagues do, that in this context, research excellence has become very narrowly defined. That what excellence means is publishing in high-profile international journals and with prestigious, largely US-based university presses. For non-Anglo colleagues, it also means publishing in English. Research excellence, it's argued, is increasingly quantified through PBRF grades, H factors, citation scores, journal impact factors and the like. Many researchers would argue that they're incentivized to perform that form of research excellence through both labour market dynamics and promotions processes. They argued that to succeed in these terms means moving up the research hierarchy by strategically publishing and focusing narrowly on the research component of their roles to the detriment of teaching in our universities and the wider forms of organisational citizenship essential to making our research ecosystem work. New Zealand researchers have a particular beef in this regard. They feel that those who focus on local topics and issues are undervalued, whereas those who are more internationalist in their aspirations get more recognition. I've lost count of the number of times I've been told that colleagues who research New Zealand topics can't get published internationally. Recognise the picture? So my view is that that analysis is extremely unhelpful. If we believe this description of our research sector, then my job in both my day job and, and in this role is to foster ever greater competition and heightened individualism at exactly the time that we need researchers who are able to offer multidisciplinary and cross-sectorial leadership in the context of the so-called Grand Challenge world. I'm particularly concerned, partly because I worry about our collective futures, so I worry about early career researchers, I'm particularly worried about the model of PhD training that we foster if we continue to act on that analysis. To caricature, to produce an excellent researcher, we subject people to a training process that plays on all their individual insecurities, including putting them in a room by themselves for three or four years to write their thesis. And at the end of that process, we expect them to be good collaborative academics, able to effectively participate in the cohorts and the communities that we need in today's world. So I think we need to be asking very different questions about the nature of research excellence. My view is that the highly individualised and competitive features of the research landscape that I've just outlined for you are both partial and dated. Research colleagues in CRIs, independent research organisations, the private sector, iwi organisations, will already be attuned to a much more porous and heterogeneous research landscape than that I described above. We might also draw attention to the proliferating number of research relationships with industry, with government, with community organisations. Women's studies, indigenous studies, development studies, long sites from which calls for new relationships with external partners have emerged and been inactive. And in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we should be particularly aware of this, given the importance and influence of kaupapa Māori 
in shaping knowledge formations and research practices in this country. Now, in my view, insufficient attention has been paid to the nature of the contemporary research landscape and the way in which it's challenging traditional conceptions of research excellence. These new forms of research require the building of new connections, connections between researchers and connections with external stakeholders. They're often premised on deep interpersonal relationships, which aim to produce socially significant knowledge through a reciprocal understanding of the expertise and insights of the partners in the research process. In the UK, where I'd been working up until three years ago, this terrain is known as co-produced research. Here in New Zealand, it's more often described as co-designed research. It's also the aspiration that underpins our national ambitions to foster mataranga Māori. Now, the impetus for these new research relationships is driven by the rise of what sometimes gets called grand challenges, hence my title. So if we take the example of our grandest of grand challenges, climate change, we know that even the climate scientists argue that the major research challenges are no longer scientific, they are regulatory, social and behavioural, and that they require new relationships and new modes of working. That's driving both an emphasis on interdisciplinarity and a new imperative for cross-sectorial working. So what we see as a result of that is that co-design is increasingly commonplace in funding calls and research initiatives like our National Science Challenges, marking an aspiration for collectively produced knowledge. We see new funding streams opening up designed to promote collaborative endeavours and co-production between researchers and external stakeholders. Now, those moves across disciplines and across organisations raise new questions that concern researchers and practitioners alike, including the problematising of established research approaches. Where traditional research practice encourages clearly defined research identities and professional relationships, Co-designed research requires reflexive engagements and emotional labour. It raises important ethical questions and generates new forms of accountability. The focus of research management shifts away from defining functional relationships to managing interpersonal dynamics. And it also, interestingly, marks a move away from the presumed masculinity of traditional leadership styles valued in the academy. Our research organisations themselves are being reconfigured through these changing infrastructures and imperatives of co-designed research. And of course, this new terrain raises new questions about what constitutes excellent research and how we might assess it. So that's the big picture. I'm now going to give you three examples just to sort of show you what I'm talking about, just in case you think this is a, a social scientist off on a little journey all of our own. So I'm going to bring you back to this organisation and I'm going to start with this organisation. Indeed, with my new role, uh, that of President of Te Aparangi. Now, we're now 151 years old as many of you know, we took the opportunity of our 150th anniversary to think really hard about how we might remain relevant for the next 150 years. I'm not going to be around for all of that, but I'm pretty clear about working uh, in that future-focused kind of way. Now, part of that discussion was about becoming a more inclusive organisation better engaging with the full range of disciplines that make up Te Aparangi and recognising the diversity of excellent colleagues other than the male scientists, love them dearly, uh, but who have historically tended to dominate the ranks of our fellowships and medals and awards winners. 
Now, for us, what that meant was acknowledging that research excellence comes in multiple forms and considering what that might mean for our nomination processes. For example, we now understand much better that to recognise the excellence of women, of Māori, it's important to take a much more holistic approach, recognising that mentoring, stakeholder engagement, impact beyond narrow disciplinary research fields may be as important as the traditional indicators such as numbers and qualities of research publications. It's also encouraged us to look hard at how we've interpreted our Act. The Royal Society of New Zealand Act allows us to award fellowship for distinction in research or the advancement of science, technologies or the humanities. Now that allows for fellowship on two grounds, research or advancement. However, historically, we have focused only on distinction in research. So we are now moving in the same way as many international academies and actively exploring that second route of advancement. Now examples here could range from major creative works through to significant inventions. If Janet Frame was still alive, would we award her fellowship alongside of her recognition by no less than the American Academy of Arts and Letters? If John Britton was alive, would we want to recognise him for the invention of the British motorcycle? Now, we're unequivocal that both research and advancement routes must demonstrate excellence through intellectual endeavour, but that to give effect to that, we might need to allow for different forms of evidence, novels, inventions. So what we see here is a more multifaceted conception of excellence, one that acknowledges that research excellence takes multiple forms. Now I've focused here on fellowship, but hopefully you can see the starting point, research excellence takes multiple forms, has implications for many other Royal Society activities. How can we work more effectively with Māori organisations? What does this mean for our early career researchers and the ways in which we engage with them? How should we structure our expert advice panels? How can we ensure that equity and diversity are integral parts of all that we do? And whatever the answer to those questions, there can be no doubt that Te Aparangi will look very different in the next 150 years than it has in the past. Let me give you another example, example two. Um, I'm also, uh, in addition to uh, my day job and uh, the work I do with uh, Te Aparangi, I'm on the main panel for the UK REF 2021 exercise. This is the equivalent of PBRF in the UK context. The main panel set the criteria for this exercise and again, here we find a reconfigured discussion about research excellence. The, the REF methodology has three parts, research outputs, uh, impact, and environment. Now this is the second assessment exercise to formally consider the impact of the research being assessed, and they've actually ramped up the percentage uh, that rests on success in this area. And the emphasis on environment is increasingly focused on the work that units do to ensure success for all, including equity and diversity, mentoring and the like. So let's, again, I'm just going to quickly take you through this in a little bit more detail because I think there's some important things to be learned from this. Now, the definition of excellence for outputs is largely the same, but really important to notice this is not a metricized uh, uh, definition of excellence. Peer review remains the means by which originality, significance, and the rigour of outputs is assessed. No H indices in here. But perhaps more interestingly for our purposes is the question of how the 
excellence of impact is assessed in REF. Now, the key terms, as you can see here, are reach and significance. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with this exercise, uh, what happens here is that impact is assessed through narrativized case studies and underpinning evidence. So around uh, this attempt to assess excellence in impact have assembled a whole bunch of people, impact case study writers, journalists, filmmakers, bloggers, public engagement experts, all of whom have had a role in ensuring the research was captured, had impacts, and that those impacts could be evidenced as excellent. And just in case you think impact is an instrumentalist approach to research, I'd encourage you to have a quick look, if you've got nothing better to do, at the highest scoring impact case studies from the first exercise. In my own geography panel, the highest scoring impact case study was the living wage. A geographer in East London invented the living wage. Unequivocally, four star impact case study. Uh, another example, a project based in Nepal, uh, working with the victims of sex trafficking, along with ones that you might expect to see, flood risk modelling, improved data for the Scottish Government and the like. Uh, but the point that I am making is that impact is not instrumentalist. Finally, let's have a think about how environment is understood in the REF exercise. This isn't a list of prizes or awards or peer esteem factors. Rather, environment is assessed on two criteria, vitality and sustainability. And look at the wording here, supporting a thriving and inclusive research culture for all staff and research students, attracting excellent postgraduate and postdoctoral researchers and then sustainability, the extent to which the research environment ensures the future health, diversity, well-being and wider contribution of the unit and discipline, including investment in people and in infrastructure. This is our future. Getting the environment right, excellence in the environment will ensure our future is right. My third example. Um, I'm going to bring this very close to home, just up the hill. I'm going to touch on a few changes in my own university. Now, one of the real challenges in the uh, uh, picture I have painted is how the changes I've discussed relate to ideas of career progression and development. As we all know, the standards of disciplinary judgment are still very powerful, even if such judgments may be increasingly out of touch with contemporary complex research practices. Disciplinary judgments based on research outputs are also inadequate mechanisms to understand both the impact of research activities and the forms of experimentation that are resulting in change behaviours, practices, and policies. So when I arrived at Victoria uh, three years ago, Victoria University of Wellington three years ago, one of the reasons I came was because this is a university that explicitly positions itself as a global civic university. And then not long after my arrival, what we did was develop a new academic career framework that tried to capture those aspirations to be a global civic university, to have an enhanced set of indicators for research excellence, and also to explicitly identify external engagement as an integral part of research activity. Now, my ambition in leading the development of that new framework was to ensure that my colleagues could see themselves in that list of indicators, that the work that they were doing, they were doing because of our career framework, not in spite of our career framework. 
uh, the, the enormously wonderful array of work that has been done in terms of engagement and impact. Now, like all universities, we're also beginning to rethink our research infrastructure, recognising that as we embed new understandings of engagement, impact and advancement, they will make new demands of our colleagues. So again, thinking about our academic professional development programmes, how our research funds work and the like. Uh, that's way too small, but it is on the web page if you want to have a closer look at the kinds of indicators that we came up with. Really important to see that external engagement sits as a separate pillar there, again, fully embedded within the profile of the work that people are doing. So what I've been trying to do, and briefly touching on those three areas of work, uh, Te Aparangi, the REF, uh, Victoria University of Wellington, is to show you the changed conceptions of research excellence that are beginning to emerge in an engaged interdisciplinary and cross-sectorial world. Let me make some further observation about the changes that we are seeing as a result of this changing research landscape. First of all, what it's doing is changing the ways in which research problems are identified. Uh, we did a piece of work on this, we did research on this topic in my previous university, and what we found was that none of the academics who identified as engaged researchers invoked their disciplines as the primary arbiter of the fields of inquiry they should pursue. For them, defining problem areas, topics of scholarship, new areas to work in, was driven by a much more complex set of factors that emerged out of their interdisciplinary and cross-sectorial engagements. Indeed, I would argue in a grand challenge research world, Disciplinarity is in many ways a barrier. It builds walls between potentially related but currently divided areas of research and practice. Secondly, this more holistic conception of research excellence requires different skill sets to those we have traditionally privileged. It challenges the narrow sensibilities of accepted research practice and privileges collaboration and community building. Established relationships, interpersonal skills, significant amounts of emotional labour are needed to negotiate not just with research partners, but with the changing expectations of both funders and host organisations who now see research collaboration as a means of delivering on wider ambitions. If we are to have researchers capable of doing that kind of work, we will need to think very differently about doctoral training, about appointments processes, and about academic professional development. We will need to appoint people as much for their ability to deliver in this heterogeneous interdisciplinary cross-sectorial world uh, rather than uh, much narrower views. Third, we'll need to recognise and value a whole set of new actors who are leveraging their knowledge of both traditional research activities and new sectors in this environment. Consultants, science communicators, public engagement experts, uh, social entrepreneurs, activists even, might all play roles in producing and circulating the knowledges of engaged research. Just to give you some examples from a co-produced research program that I was involved in, the community activist with a PhD who was contracted to build the relationships between three universities and seven community organisations. The graduate student who was also a documentary filmmaker and visually captured the collaborative research process. The artist in residence who worked to present traditional research outputs in new ways. The social enterprise leader who ran their own consultancy and was contracted to do part-time teaching in a community development course that grew out of the research programme. 
none of those people fit neatly into the categories that we have for who is our researcher. Fourthly, uh, this is an environment that's changing and challenging our funding environments, our funding arrangements. We know from Māori colleagues and from community organisation the importance of research partners being named as full co-investigators rather than simply as subcontractors. This means that such partners need to be brought in at the beginning of the research process, not just tagged on a few days before submission, and they need to be recognised as full contributors to the research process. Now, to deliver on those ambitions for collaborative research, I think we're likely to see the rise of two-stage funding models that allow for the explicit funding of relationship building and for partnerships in which non-traditional research organisations have control over their portion of the funding. Finally, a plurality of research outputs emerge from such creative research programs, including not just conventional research outputs, but also possibly practitioner resources, creative works. And this is a particular challenge for universities as non-traditional outputs begin to spread from their natural home and arts and find their way into other disciplines. So I'm sure we're all having the discussion about the format in which PhDs can be submitted. I certainly didn't find, expect to find myself supervising a documentary film uh, rather than the standard 300 page tome that is normally a PhD. And the research program that I've referred to above also produced various art installations, a novel, and a very wide range of practitioner publications. Again, how will we capture these? Uh, how will we uh, um, broaden our conception of what's a research output in this kind of environment? So finally, some points that I want to make by way of a conclusion. Uh, some of you in the room know that there's been a lot of discussion about codes and charters in the uh, New Zealand context recently. In this new era, there is an onus on research organisations to act as the guarantor of relationships, of care and responsibility towards partners, of research standards, of financial and legal probity. That might be operationalised, for example, in principles to guide the conduct of engaged and collaborative research, clear statements about the principles that guide academic inquiry and that then might handle issues of potential conflicts of interest, complaints. We need financial and legal models that are clear, transparent and meaningful to all parties in research collaborations. In short, in our increasingly heterogeneous research world, we need very clear articulations of the principles that research should be governed by, and that's why codes and charters are becoming increasingly important. Secondly, research organisations will need to invest in long-term collaborations. Too often our collaboration models are premised on the continuing interests of an individual researcher and or short-term project funding. Both of those situations leave community collaborators in particular, uh, industrial partners have fewer such dependencies, in very vulnerable, posi vulnerable positions in the relationship. The challenge is to either exit well when the project funding finishes or to develop a set of shared institutional interests that would be held in common and enable joint investment over a longer period beyond the individual researcher, beyond the individual project. So our organisations will have to think hard about building relationships. Our organisations will also have to facilitate multidisciplinarity. And that's not just about building interdisciplinary networks amongst researchers, although that's hugely important and as someone who's done a lot of it over the years shouldn't be underestimated. It's about actively creating opportunities for stakeholder relationships to be extended beyond the initial, often disciplinary 
point of contact to create connections across the disciplines. Creating conditions of serendipity for academics, their collaborators and others to come together, to share ideas, to create new and surprising connections. This kind of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Cauldron, cauldron? Cauldron sounds like you're cooking something. But, but these encounters are absolutely crucial. So too is a more structured orientation within our organisations that encourages shared project development beyond initial points of collaboration. Finally, we need to take a meta-level perspective on the collaborations that are developing. Critically examining the types of groups who are systematically under or over-represented in these processes. Individual researchers will tend to build strong research relationships with those with whom they have shared interests and common backgrounds, or with those who can provide access to powerful resources or specific communities. Now, there's a risk that such approach leads to a concentration of research energy around specific groups and concerns. There's a critical role for research organisations to play in first understanding the nature of the publics, that are being constructed in the move towards engaged research, and second, taking informed decisions about the oversights and or exclusions that will necessarily emerge. Such a perspective involves starting from the recognition that just as research is a highly diverse and contested set of practices, so too are our potential partners, diverse, contested, freighted with inequalities and hierarchies of knowledge and resource. Now, none of this will be straightforward. Much of it is deeply challenging for funders, research organisations and researchers alike, but it is the world in which we are now working. And what should be very clear by now is my key point, that in an era of engagement, impact, advancement, you can choose your term, uh, we will need to think very differently about research excellence. And if we do, and if we get this right, then not only will our research be enhanced, but our relevance uh, as researchers to the communities that we serve will be strengthened. No rara, via te iki kahurangi, which translates as strive for something of excellence. Kia ora koutou.